good fences make good neighbors. Now, I remember first hearing that phrase when I was growing up in Texas, and my grandparents there in Texas would say it, good fences make good neighbors. And in case you don't talk Texan here, let me translate for you. If you want a friendship to last, if you want a relationship to work over time, you need to respect some basic boundaries. If you don't put up a fence around your land, you may find that your neighbors turn into nightmares. And clearly marked borders are good in our life. They keep good friends friendly and maybe even some bad enemies at bay. And so wide open spaces sound wonderful in a way, in theory maybe, but they actually can lead to disputes and divisions and even death in our lives. And so you see, good fences make good neighbors. Now, as you think about that, spiritually speaking, the same is true with one minor modification. God's fences make good neighbors. God's fences, you may ask, as you think about that, yeah, not just man-made restrictions or man-made markers or rules and regulation, that kind of thing. God's fences, the things that he really has said for our life, and they might be fewer than many people would think. Sometimes people think, oh, God's all into the rule and regulation thing. No, not at all. But he does have guidelines. He does have commands, and they are for our benefit. And God's word has some very clear distinctions and divisions in them, some definite divisions where he says, hey, this is good, this is bad, this is light, this is dark, this is yours, this is theirs, this is mine, this is healthy, this is hurtful. And so if we will respect God's fences, we'll find our friendships, we'll find our families flourishing. That's the promise of God. And on the other hand, if we insist on leaving things wide open, well, we really leave ourselves wide open to conflict and chaos. And God doesn't want that for us, and I hope we don't want that for our own lives either. And so the last three chapters of the book of Numbers, the Israelites are given some God-given fences, some borders, some boundaries. And God's message to them, I believe, and also to us, is that they could not live in the promised land without fences. And, by extension, you and I cannot have the promised life without fences some fences. And so Numbers 34 lays down some of those boundaries. When the Lord spoke to Moses there in verse 1, Numbers 34, saying, command the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall to you as an inheritance, the land of Canaan to its boundaries. Now, I will stop there, and I don't want to bore you with the boundaries, I don't even want to try to pronounce a lot of the names, but you see, you can summarize that first section of chapter 34, the first 12 verses, 20 times you're going to see some variation of the word border or boundary. And they're very specific as he lays them out. It's like, okay, go go this far, go down this, take a turn, and this will be the outline of your spot. And so God is giving them good fences at this point, or as we're looking at it today, God fences. He is laying out the land for them. And he's saying basically to them, hey, this is your proper place in the promised land. And I love it because he says, no more, but he's really also saying no less. See, it's both of those. No more, no less. This is what I have for you. And can you imagine what would have happened to these folks here if God had just said to them, all right, uh, promised land, everybody line up on your mark, get set, go, you know, and just... Every man, woman, and child for themselves as they try to take territory. Well, that's happened in human history, and we see what happens with it. It would have been total chaos, right? It would have been the frontier, right? It would have been civil war from the very start, in a way, never defeating their real enemies so much as seeing each other as the competition and defeating each other, fighting each other. And so we see the benefit of boundaries right away here in this chapter, borders. And you and I need to let God draw some clear boundaries around our lives. He wants to do that. He's promised to do that, and it's for our benefit. If we don't do that, if we don't allow him to do that, you know what's going to happen? We'll find that the promised life always eludes us. We always wander in the wilderness, and we always wonder, why am I in the wilderness? And so often it comes back to these things that we'll talk about tonight. The promised life. Well, I remind you, for every New Testament principle, there is an Old Testament picture, at least one, sometimes many. But the promised land in the Old Testament is a picture of the promised life 
in the New Testament. John 10.10, 10, you know this scripture well if you've been here any amount of time. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it to the full. That you might have abundant life, eternal life, all of that, the life found in Christ. And in the Old Testament, God's promise was a place, Canaan, the land of Canaan, the land of milk and honey. And in the New Testament, the promise is a person, not a place, a person, Jesus. And to know him, to know that person, and to follow him, to live by his fences even, his commands, is to live life to its very fullest, to its very freest. And if your heart is crying out somewhere within, hey, I want the life that is promised by God. I want life, and I want life to the full. I'm tired of just existing. What you're really saying is, I want a healthy relationship with God, and I want a healthy relationship with other people. See, the quality of our life, eternal life, when Jesus promised it, it's not just a never-ending life. That's just a quantity of life, and if it's a terrible life, who wants it to go on forever? But it's more than that. It's a quality of life that can start the moment you know him and continue on forever. And so the quality of our life, the eternal life, the abundant life, depends on the quality of two relationships in our life. It boils down to this, our relationship with God and our relationship with others. Two relationships. Our relationship with God, our relationship with each other. And I like to summarize things as much as I can because sometimes I need to conserve brain cells. And a four-word summary of the Bible, if you want to memorize the whole Bible in a way, here it is. Love God, love others. That's what it all boils down to. When someone said, hey, what's the greatest command to Jesus? He said, well, uh, the first one, the greatest of all commands is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So love God, love it, others. The rest is details in the Bible on how to do that. And you can't do that without God's fences. Some people seem to think that true freedom is found in life without fences. You know, the wilderness, that's what's for me. I'm born to be wild and that kind of stuff. You know, the wilderness, that's how you say the wilderness. No fences for me, baby. Freedom. And here's the thing. When anything and everything goes, you know what tends to go? Friendship. Any sense of respect from others or for others, honor, integrity, trust, all of those things, good fences make for good neighbors. And so we'll never exp experience the promised life, the full life, if we ignore God's fences, his boundaries and borders for our life. And that's why the last part of Numbers, as they're just getting ready to go into the promised land, focuses on fences. And it's why we look at them to, together tonight. Now, when the Israelites were wandering aimlessly in the wilderness, we need to take note of it. There were no borders, and there was no order in their life. No border, no order. No fences, no defenses, but lots of offenses you may have seen as we went through it. No promised land for them, no promised life for them, just a death march. But now the Israelites are kind of turning a corner here, and they are headed into the promised land, but it's a different thing greener pastures certainly the grass is greener on god's side of the fence in life but you know what they would have to do some things a little differently than they had done them in the wilderness or for that matter had done them while they were slaves back in egypt and if you and i are going to live the promised life we're going to have to do things a little differently than we did them when we were stuck in the slavery of sin or even wandering in the wilderness and the desert of drought and doubt. So again, the quality of our life is going to depend on our relationship to God and our relationship with others. Fences and borders and boundaries. The ones that are God-given, well, they are for our benefit and our blessing. And so parents certainly know this, I hope. I am learning it. We just got back from a family vacation. Now, that's what's known as an oxymoron. Now, some of you are saying, don't use words like moron in here. No, I, an oxymoron is... A thing that is a juxtaposition. Two truths that don't seem to add up, don't seem to make any sense. You know, a family vacation. Look, if you're with your family, how could it be a vacation? You need a vacation from your family sometimes. But here's the thing. We went on this family vacation. Three kids and a puppy. A puppy. Like, it wasn't bad enough. We decided, let's take the new puppy. And so, 12 hours. We decided to do it with no stops, really. We did three stops. We had to stop for gas. 
800 miles, all right, pedal to the metal. Now, we put up a barrier. My wife was really smart. She put up a barrier between us and the kids. We had always said, hey, wouldn't that be a neat design for a car where you just had a window that went zoop right behind you, and you just let them scream and do whatever, and if they live through the trip, that's great. But you're up there just nice and silent. But we did kind of our own little homemade thing of that. But nevertheless, Lynn's homesick even now, so I guess she's still sick and tired. But when you think about it, it reminded me of my own childhood. You know, that's the funny thing about being a parent is you can still remember being a kid. And my sister Karen, I had an older sister, much less mature, of course, but her, <laughs> she and I, uh, we would go on the car trip. And one of the things she loved to do was sing to the radio, you know, and it was back in the days when she was really into Barry Gibb. I don't know if you remember him, but uh, there was a song called Blood is Thicker Than Water or something. She would just sing this thing over and over again. And I was like, Mom, she's singing again. You know, we'd be on these long-term trips, you know, family vacations and uh, mom she's she's talking again dad please she's singing again and they would say hey karen you can sing but sing in your head you know <laughs> so she would look at me and she would mouth the words we'd sit in the back of the the uh <laughs> big family truckster there and she'd be like <laughs> you know and not making any noise that my parents could hear but i could hear her lips smacking and i'd say mom dad i can hear her lips smacking she's smacking her lips and so they'd say, Karen, please try not to smack. And then I'd say just, you know, brother things like, I can still hear her breathing. She's breathing really loud. She's trying to annoy me. And, and so they, you know, <laughs> would do what parents do, threaten to turn, the, you know, take the car to the side of the road and all that stuff. And the, the great thing is my sister and I are good friends today, great friends, and I have a great relationship with my own family, by God's grace, and with Lynn's family and all the rest of that. But... As a pastor, I know uh, that certainly a lot of families do have a lot of friction. And it's one of those things I do a lot of family counsel. And let me say this as tactfully as I possibly can. I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings. But the bottom line is this. A lot of families need better borders. They need better boundaries is the bottom line. Parents uh, or people maybe are still in adult people's lives, but they, they lead this life where they're led by guilt and, and manipulation and all these things, and they let people come into their lives and lay all those trips on them still, and you say, well, wait a minute. Who's going to put that border there if not you? There's got to be a God fence in a person's life, and that's to keep in-laws from becoming outlaws for you. And only you, really, can put the fence where it belongs because we can't look at other people's lives and expect them to put the border in the right place. Why? It's a God fence. And so if a person really doesn't understand God's word or see those things, they're not going to put it in the right place. Your employer isn't going to draw a boundary and say, well, I want to make sure you don't, you know, sacrifice your family on the altar of selfish ambition. Here, let me put this boundary here so that you don't overstep it. And you go, wait, that's not going to happen. Only we can put that fence there by God's grace. And so if you think about it, marriage is a redrawing of some lines. It's meant to be. God said in Genesis 2.24, Leave and cleave. What he was saying is, hey, form a new fence. The parent is no longer primary in your life. It can't be. They can't be. New fence, new family. And it's one of those things that it's well, uh, something that those good fences will make good neighbors, but yeah, good families too. And respecting the family fences. Now, on the other end of the scale, of course, there are those who are parents and maybe they don't put any fence at all in there kids lives you know maybe their parent was not there or something they want to be just much more free with their kids or something they say oh man my kids can do whatever they want i don't want any fences in my little lammy's life you know i don't want to limit them i don't want to i want them to live their creativity and all this stuff you know what i've heard people say i don't want to force them into the faith you know so i don't take them to church i know they're four years old but i let them make their own choice i let them make their own choice about faith now wait a minute do you do that with school with your kids? You say, oh, well, I don't want them to resent education, so I let them make their own choice each morning whether they want to go to school today or not. You know, brushing their teeth at night, well, I don't want them to resent the dentist, you know. I, I want them to love the dentist and love hygiene, so I let them make their own choice on whether they want to brush or not. Wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. And so a lot of families really need some better boundaries. And until our kids are adults, you know what? It is our role to make God's fences, our fences first as parents. Hey, I'm not going to put a fence in my kid's life that I won't respect in my own life. But you know what? God's fences are my fences, and they're their fences too. 
And along the way, yeah, I'm going to give them that freedom to make choices, little by little, giving them that, but also allow them to go through the consequences of bad choices. Why? So that they learn that God's fences are good fences, and they're for their benefit. And so fences hold us in, it's true, but they hold us back from sin a lot. And a thing that we really have to see in some cases is that God really isn't looking to hold us back, but to free us up. See, God-given fences free us. That's something we need to internalize and understand and know beyond a shadow of a doubt. God's given fences in our life, they are there to free us because they are frontiers in our life. They call us forward. Fences call us forward. What do you mean by that? I thought you said they hold us back. Well, they do hold us back from some of the bad stuff, but you know what? They also call us on to some of the good stuff. I think there's a lot of people out there who sit and stare at the fence post that God has put there and say, why is that there? I don't understand why that fence post is there. I don't want that there. I want to move that thing. And you say, well, wait a minute. Have you ever looked at what else is out there? There's so much more to life and life with God than the boundaries that he lays. It's really the bounty that he gives. The bountiful things. Look how much God has given in our lives inside the fences. You know, again, back from this vacation, just thinking about it, we were visiting family, and Lynn's sister and her husband, his name's Brett, they live on a country lot in a really nice part there of the wooded areas of Charlotte. If you've never been there, it's a really nice place. And uh, I asked Brett, you know, my brother-in-law, how big is your property? I mean, you know, I was looking out over it like you do in the country. You know, you kind of look out over it and you go, well, how big is this place? You know, and, and he said, well, it's from that fence to that flag way down there, you know, and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, wow, this is bigger than I thought even. And at that point, my wheels started spinning. I thought, you know what? You could build a really big guest house for your family uh, from Miami so we didn't have to share the you know, rooms and sleep out in the living room and all that stuff. It would be great you know, to have kind of a permanent place that we could invite all our friends to up in North Carolina and all that stuff. You know what? He was really not immediately warm to the idea, but we'll, we'll talk it through. But good fences, hey, they make good families. So I guess he knows that too. And a fence... Again, what I was saying, it's a frontier. What does that mean? It calls you out to the edge. It calls you to say and look, wow, look at this whole thing. There's a lot of land here. There's a lot here. Untapped potential. Things I haven't even noticed while I was staring at the pole and saying, why is that there? He said, oh, wow, look at all that is here. And see, I think about it this way. God gave us the opportunity to purchase a 10-acre property here at CCK. And I remember being in that meeting there, and we were all kind of thinking, man, that's way too big. Now, that was a long time before there were so many people here. But it was one of those things where you go, wow, we could never use 10 whole acres. Whoa, you know? And yet one of the people there said this, you know what? There's 10 acres available. And if God wasn't going to fill those 10 acres, I don't think he'd have that 10 acres available. I think we need to stretch our faith and go for this. You know, and I think about that, that fence now in our lives becomes a frontier that we look at it and say, yeah, God is calling us out there. And we're looking at those plans and those things and more to come on that. But you see, God, he had so much of a frontier for Israel, and that's part of the border there. He put that fence out there and said, look how far, look how much. And you know what? They never took a hold fully of what God had given them. It was amazing. He said, this is what you'll have when you go into Canaan. And they never actually went that far because so often, again, they were fighting with each other and looking at the, land, the little posts and all that. Big borders, plenty to conquer, plenty to enjoy. And the funny thing I found as a parent, you know, is how often kids will fight over one toy. They'll be in a room, and there's a toy box full of toys, and they all want the same toy. Why do they want that toy? Well, I don't know, because the other kid wants it. And then they fight over that one, and finally they lose interest, and the kid goes and picks another toy, and whoomp, they're now all fighting over that one. What is it with that? That's sin is what that is. That's the territorialism that is so selfish. And so God so often is saying, look, what are you doing looking over the fence over there? What about what I've given you? And so God's fences in our life they free us they call us out to a frontier of what he's doing in our life and i love the way that psalm 16 5 through 6 puts it this is a, a reading here from the niv version but it's psalm 16 5 through 6 and it says lord you have assigned me my portion and my cup and you've made my lot secure and he says the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places Surely I have a delightful inheritance. This is a guy saying, man, I love 
the fences that you have put in my life. They are both for security and satisfaction, and they've fallen in pleasant places, and God, I love them. And so the fences, as the psalmist is saying here, they're for our blessing. And God has given us boundless opportunities in our life and a few key boundaries to say, hey, this is for your blessing. Think of it in Genesis. I love to think on the character of God all throughout the Bible. You see in Genesis, the early part of the Bible, he says, of all the trees and the fruits thereof, you may eat except for this one. So many people think of God this way. Hey, you only get this one to eat and none of the rest of that stuff can you touch. No, you see him being extremely bountiful, but a few boundaries for their good. And what did they do? They did what we so often do. We went to the fence and say, why is that there? I want to move that. And so you see in verse 13 through 29 of this chapter here in Numbers 24, or 34, I'm sorry, Numbers 34, verse 13 to 29, just summarizing the second section, you're going to see that God didn't just give, just give fences in their life. He also gave folks in charge of the fences. He gave some leaders, and it lists out their names there. And so... Again, if you're a parent here tonight, you're in charge of the fences in your house and in your family. Nobody else is going to do that. Physical and spiritual, that's your responsibility. And here in this church, of course, God has raised up certain leaders and, and more all the time who are in charge of the fences, physical and spiritual. Now, if, as I'm sure you're aware, if you paid any attention, there's a canal at the, the border down here of this property on one side. And after that, the turnpike, you know, right there, which is... Uh, Trucks basically going 80 miles an hour in cars trying to catch up. And so what happens is we lock the gates. There's gates in there, and they have to go down to mow and do all that stuff. So it does have to open, but we make sure they're locked all the time. And one day I was driving along the turnpike, and I looked over, and I realized, man, the, the gate is wide open. You know, the, the lawn maintenance is gone, but the gate is still open. And I got on the phone, and I called the office and said, hey, guys, get down and close that gate right away. Why? Because a lot of times there's kids here on the property, and a lot of times there's people who are trusting, hey, that gate is there, and that fence is there. And the thing is, we don't want any kids to drown or get mowed down or head out onto the highway and all that stuff, you know, looking for adventure. No way. Now, some would say, oh, you're so restrictive. I hope nobody would think that way. Let the child run free, you know. We do within the borders of the safety and security of the place. So not just... Fences to fence them in, but also folks to enforce those things. And you know what? I believe we should respect those fences and those folks and teach our kids to do the same. Now, when our son, Stephen, was about four years old, you know, he was running out into the parking lot at the church we were attending, you know, and he was chasing a ball. He's always chasing a ball today. Those of you who see him out there on the basketball court he's always there but he's always been interested in in basketballs and all the rest but he's chasing this ball and a car was coming and this usher grabbed him by the arm and kept him from getting hit right there kept him from getting run over and corrected him you know hey we told you don't run out into this area and all the rest now little steven at that point looked up at that usher and he put his hands on his hips and he said you are a bad man <laughs> now Speaking of borders, I had to apply a board to Stephen's back border at the time. <laughs> now, we laugh about that as a family and with this friend. He's still a friend today. That man was a good man. He wasn't a bad man. He was a good friend because he helped us keep the fences around our family, physically, spiritually. And so we see tonight the importance of fences. And we also see the importance of fellowship. That's in chapter 35, the importance of fellowship. You're going to see if you'll read in... The first three verses there with me, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from the Jericho, saying, Command the children of Israel that they give the Levites cities to dwell in from the inheritance of their possession, and you shall also give the Levites common land. Pay close attention to those uh, hyphenated words there. Common land around the cities. They shall have the cities to dwell in. Their common land shall be for their cattle, for their herds, and for all their animals. Now, again, stopping there, you're seeing that little phrase, common land, common areas, and, and it's just a reminder, the Levitical priesthood, the Levites there, those who were in charge of the temple and all that, they didn't get their own land. They didn't get their own place in the promised land, but they had places in the promised land because they had work to do. They had things to do, and they were given a slice of every other tribe's 
land. And so they, God said, hey, give them some of your land. And you see the Levites scattered throughout the land that way. It wasn't just in one little place. They were all throughout and infiltrating that area. And so, again, the Levites were meant to be a blessing to all of them and a place for them to raise the animals that would be for sacrifice and service and all that. Now, again, there's a picture being painted here. It's a lesson for them. It's also a lesson for us, which is if you want to experience the promised life, and I hope you do, it cannot be enjoyed without borders, but it also cannot be enjoyed without others. It can't be enjoyed by yourself. We need fences, but we need fellowship. That's that common area land that they were to give in some way. And I know the modern mentality is very individualist. You know, it's just me and Jesus. You know, I got this thing going with him. I like him. I'm not so sure about all the rest of the people out there. You know, and I kind of have my Bible teachers on the TV and on the radio. I can even hear Pastor Pedro on the radio. I can watch him on the web. Maybe he's watching right now. I don't know. You know, but here's the thing. People say, oh, I can't stand the church. You know, it's too much trouble. Well, that reminds me of a letter I got a little while ago, several years ago, actually. It said at the top of it, it was addressed this way. Dear bothers and sisters in Christ. Now, that was a typo. It was unintentional, you know. It, they just left out the R. It was supposed to say brothers and sisters in Christ. But I look and I say, oh, bothers and, well, at least they're honest. <laughs> there are some bothers in the church, right? But it's tragically true of far too many people that they use that as an excuse to say, well, I'm not going to do it. It's too much trouble. I'm not going to have fellowship. And it's important to have borders in our life, but it's also very important to see that too much insulation can lead to isolation. And you know what? God's fences included places for fellowship. You see in Hebrews 10, 25, such a great New Testament understanding of this is very clear. It says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So in Numbers, you see that God specifically laid out some areas for fellowship, fellowship with him and fellowship with one another. And the more they got, well, the more they gave. And you see common lands there, community, that unity. And people, they got back from it. What did they give? Well, they gave some of their land up. What did they get back from it? Well, they got a community life, people who prayed for them, people who served them and served alongside them and a spiritual connection. And today, of course, fellowship still has costs. It did then, it does now. And it costs something to come to church. Some of you probably paid about $84 in gas and tolls to get here, I would guess, at current prices, you know, something like that. You're giving up your time right now, right? Uh, you know, your the time is money, and this is costing you some time. And it may be costing you uh, finding out what happened in American Idol. Now, some of you are saying, no, I can text, I can figure out right away, I've got TiVo going or whatever, you know, but th there, I know there's some things that have to be given up sometimes. But you know what? There's so much more than that, of course. Physical, emotional, spiritual costs of fellowship. And I often say, hey, you know what? When it comes to church, it's like all things. You get out of it what you put into it. And there are a lot of people who are real happy to take out of it. You know, the benefits of the body. Oh, man, I don't know what you're talking about, cost of fellowship, man. I think it's wonderful. I love the playground here at CCK, man. It's awesome. I drop my kids out there for three services on Sunday. I go to the movies, man. I can even see a double feature and still come back, you know, and JP and the gang are still back there doing it all, you know. And you go, wait a minute, fellowship. Sometimes that's just a word in our society, modern church for consumerism, for spectatorship, for hanging out. But that's really not what fellowship was in the Bible. No, it was not so much about, hey, what can I get together and get? It was what could I get together and give? What could I do? for one another. See, that's what it says, that we would encourage one another as we get together. Now, again, my point here is not to make some, oh, oh you know, I, you're laying a trip on me. No, that's not it. Here's the thing. God's fences, God's way, what, how does it work? Well, Proverbs eleven twenty five. I love the way it puts it. It says, the one who waters will himself be watered. Proverbs eleven twenty five. The one who waters will also be watered himself. What's that? Well, sometimes if a person gets into just receiving all that happens in their life, they dry up and they say, ah, I need to move on to another church. I'm just not getting fed here. And you go, wait a minute. There's so much more to it than that. See, the more you give of your time and treasures and talents, the more you get. That's how God's economy works. And we have 
a messed up hose at our house. You know, we ran over it one year and just never really replaced it. And it gives me the understanding of that proverb right there. The one who waters will himself be watered. You know, it's impossible. Now, I know there's water restrictions and all those kind of things. I'm not talking about illegal activity here. But, you know, on the day that I could do it, if I water the plants or I wash the car or whatever else, it is impossible for me to water without getting watered. I get more wet than what's happening there. And you know what? That's the truth here. Every time I come here, I think I get more encouraged than I get discouraged. You know, I get fed and the joy of the friendship and the fellowship that is shared with those that you serve alongside. So it's such a great thing when you see God is wanting that for us, not from us. He's saying, hey, come with that mentality. What could I give? Not what can I get? And you know what? You'll find out you get more than you ever give. And so that would be the person who God would overflow with blessing, the person who understands fences, a person who understands the importance of fellowship. And if you've ever had fellowship, you know you'll also have hardship. Hardship that goes with fellowship. Yeah, see, here's the thing. You bump up against other folks. And even if you have fences, you know what? There will be offenses. Intentionally or accidentally, people are going to hurt your feelings. People are going to bust through your boundaries on purpose or on accident. There might be even some people right here in this room that you go, yeah, that person's trespassed against me. Let me tell you, that's why I'm on the opposite side of the room, you know, and I'm, ho I'm glad you're building maybe a bigger sanctuary so I can get further away from them or something like that. Well, that's when you get to the importance of forgiveness. And it talks here about the cities of refuge. Now, Numbers 35 is verses 11 and 12 that we look at together. It says, then you shall appoint cities to be the cities of refuge for you and that manslayer who kills any person accidentally that they may flee there. They shall be cities of refuge for you from the avenger that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation in judgment. Now, again, looking at that center section there of Numbers 35, it's talking about cities of refuge. And we've talked already about fences. We've talked about fellowship, but now, again, the importance of forgiveness, cities of refuge. And you see here, culturally at that time, it was basically vigilante justice. I mean, that's what it was out there in the wilderness and in the places they were going. It was this understanding, hey, the nearest relative had a responsibility. They would call them the Avenger here. It sounds like a uh, superhero, you know, maybe that'll be the next one after Spider-Man. But if you were the Avenger here, you were if you were the cause of death in my family, even if it was an accident, it was my role, my responsibility, in fact, to track you down and take your life, blood for blood, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and all the rest of that. Now, within this context, you see God providing for forgiveness, for mercy, for grace. And there you see it, the city of refuge. It's like a base in a game of tag. You ever played tag as a kid, you know, and you'd come to base. And sometimes you'd taunt the people and go, I'm on base, can't get me, ha ha, you know, ah, you know, ah, and all that, kind of, race you to base and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's what they're saying. Hey, Avenger, you can't get me here. I'm at the grace base. You can't get me. I'm in the city of refuge. And notice what you see in verse 16 and the following. If you just glance down through it, you're going to see a very clear set of guidelines for the distinction between manslaughter and murder. You're going to see the difference between things that were, uh, oops, somebody died, and uh, somebody killed somebody and meant to do it, and is glad they did it and would do it again, given the opportunity. And so I think it's really important for us to see this as we talk about forgiveness, because Romans 13, you know, sometimes people say, oh, you know, capital crimes or this or the other. We're supposed to be Christians now. We have that big forgiveness thing and all that kind of stuff. Wait, Romans 13, New Testament Scripture says, the government's God-given role, not individual vigilante justice. I'm not talking about that. But it says the government's God-given role is to wield the sword against the wicked, to stop the wickedness, to put it out there, and to hold up those good godly fences and even punish offenses. See, a murderer who pollutes the land, that's what it says here. Well, that's a serious thing. And we are made in the image of God. And God values life very, very highly. And so we can learn a lot, I think, about the nature of God and the nature of his forgiveness by paying close attention to the pictures, even in 
that are painted here in the city of refuge. Of course, we understand forgiveness in its fullness in the New Testament, but there's so much that God paints even in this for us to see. And one of the things we see is that forgiveness is not the taking away of fences or consequences. I think there's a lot of people who have that understanding. Oh, forgiveness, great space, you can't touch me, wait a minute, you know, all that kind of stuff. Wait, forgiveness is not the elimination of boundaries in our lives or being able to say that is wrong and it cannot be tolerated. It's not allowing people to get away with murder and saying, well, you know, all is forgiven. God is a God of justice. He's a God of mercy. You see both of those in perfect balance and choices will always have consequences. And even forgiven sin has consequences and pain and suffering associated with it. Now, this is what's great to understand it this way. Forgiveness means I'm not going to hell for my sin. But it doesn't necessarily mean I'm not going through hell for my sin on earth. It doesn't mean I'm not necessarily going to go to jail for my sin or maybe even to death row. And so I like to think of it in analogies and hopefully this one will help. I have mentioned already my son's playing basketball and I'm learning a lot about it, but fouls in basketball, you know, you see it's a part of, of basketball is foul. And if a person doesn't know the game and I didn't, you know, I would watch it and I would say to myself, wait a minute, these refs are idiots. I mean, a guy just got knocked on his back and the foul is called on him. He's the guy on the floor, and then they penalize the guy. Again, on top of that, what are you talking about? These refs are idiots. And my son explains it to me. He says, you know what? It's not just the guy on the floor that automatically has got the foul or not got the foul. This is the thing. Knowing the rule, understanding what the ref is saying here, there's a place to put your feet. You're supposed to stand in a spot and be secure in that spot. If you're stopped in that spot and you are not moving and you're in the right spot, if you get knocked down, the foul's on the guy who knocked you down. But if you're all over the place and you're a moving target and you're where you're not supposed to be and a guy knocks you down, the foul's on you. You go, how can that be? Because that's the rule. That's the way it is. That's how the fouls work. And so if you're not planted, you can get knocked over and still have the foul called on you. Now, what does all this have to do with our lives? It has everything to do with it because forgiveness is allowing God to be the referee in our life and call the fouls the way he knows them to be. And you may say, but wait a minute, you don't understand. I was fouled. I was right. I know for sure I was right. Okay, the foul's on them. Well, then where's the whistle? Where's the penalty? Well, that's a different game. This isn't basketball. See, God is going to make things right but not necessarily right now. And so you see that there are times where he says, hey, I will make all things right. You're not going to be able to say God was a bad referee. No, he sees it. He saw it. He knows it. And you know what? We all need to run to the city of refuge because he's seen it in all of our lives. See, the same thing, well, where's the whistle? And they go, well, there's a whistle in my life too, isn't there? So I need to get to that city of refuge. I can't be worried too much about being an avenger of some other sin that somebody did against me because you know what? I better be on my way to the city of refuge. And I got no business poking my head out of it, running away to go find the faults in others because I better stay where I'm supposed to be. And I like to think of it this way. The best defense in life is a good God fence. The best defense is a good God fence and let him call the fouls the way he sees them. And forgiveness has so much to do with this mentality, which is letting God be the referee. And if you get knocked down in life and you will, let God be the one to blow the whistle when he wants to and how he wants to and make the call and set the penalties the way he wants to, because God's a great ref. He's not blind. He doesn't forget. The sins that will be covered are those that are covered in Christ for those who have come to that. And the rest will be dealt with as God sees fit. And the game's not over yet. So forgiveness has all to do with letting God be the avenger, letting God be the ref, letting him be not only the ref, but our refuge. See the city of refuge. How did it work? Well, let's say Pastor George and I were working together out here on these uh, modulars at the back and there's bricks and things out there and I throw a brick at him on person purpose because I'm mad you know I had it with him I throw a brick at him well do I get to go to the city of refuge no why because I just threw a brick at a guy and you can't say well I was temporarily insane of course you were or you wouldn't have thrown the brick and so 
that's right there. That's a whole different issue. But let's say George says, hey, throw me a brick. I throw him a brick, and I'm a bad throw, because I am. And it hits him right in the head. Ah, poof, boom, he's dead. One brick. You say, oh, no, how can this be? Pastor George, no, it was an accident. But I better start running. I better start running to the city of refuge. Why? Because sissy, his wife, the Avenger, is going to come get me. That's why. <laughs> it was the response of the relative to come and get it. And I'm not going to be, but you don't understand. He told me to throw it. You know, I, 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 just a bad throw. I didn't mean to hit him. You know, my only hope for mercy really at that point is to run to the city of refuge, a place of grace. But again, remember, grace is not Greece. Nowhere in the Bible do you see that kind of thing where it's just, oh, well, grace, you know, let's sin, keep going, who cares, you know. Not that way. No, you see, city of refuge, not a place for willful, wicked killers to hide from the consequence of their killing. The city of refuge was a place for people who had made a mess of things in their life, who were ready to run for help and healing and say, listen, I don't deserve this maybe, but I sure need it. I am sorry. I'm guilty. I, I did it. I'd do anything to undo it if I could, but I can't. So what do I do? What I can do, run to God for refuge and throw myself on his mercy. And so you see last chapter, chapter 36, the end of numbers, the end of the wilderness wandering. And we've seen already the importance of fences. We've seen the importance of fellowship. We've seen the importance of forgiveness. And finally, we see the importance of focus, the importance of focus. Now, you know, when something's out of focus, it's fuzzy, right? That's why I picked that word in focus clarity. I can see everything really clear when something's out of focus. It's kind of fuzzy. And chapter 36, well, there's some fuzzy things going on. in it. There's some people who are confused. There's leaders coming up to Moses with a question and they say, hey, where's God's fence in this situation? We don't know what to do. We're a little fuzzy. We need clarity. We need to see things better than we do. We're confused. Now, the very important context for us to see here is that these were representatives in chapter 36 from one of the two and a half tribes who had said already, we want to stay on this side of the Jordan. We don't really want to go all the way fully into Canaan. We'd kind of like to stay here on the border of blessings. And I thought Pedro did such a great job of just explaining with that that they were kind of the compromisers. They're like, hey, you know, we want to sit here on the fence. We don't want to go all the way in. There's all kinds of stuff there. Yeah, there's great things. The grass may be greener on God's side of the fence, but the dog over there may be meaner. So I better just stay right here. And so back in Numbers 27, they brought a question to Moses. Hey, can we stay here? <laughs> yeah. And then it says, you know what? If a dad dies, it was kind of a little legal question that they brought to Moses. It seems like a strange ending to this whole book, but you'll see how it fits in. What if a dad dies without sons? You know, that's how the property passed, you know, in the promised land and all this. Do his daughters get the land? And Moses said, yes. He goes and seeks the Lord. The Lord says, yeah, they get it. Now, they're coming back with a follow-up question. They say, hey, we're a little fuzzy. We got home, we started thinking about it, you know. And I, I have to believe that Moses must have been kind of stumbling down the steps of the bad memories in his mind. You know, people always coming back with these things, and he's like, what now? What are these guys coming to do now? Their second question, hey, we got a follow-up. We were satisfied when you said the daughters get the dad's inheritance. We like that part, but we got to thinking when we went home. Yeah, but what if? What if the daughter then decides to marry someone from the other nine and a half tribes over there on the other side? And, and what then, man? What do we do? Won't that mean that our land will kind of leave and go with the new husband eventually and we'll kind of lose some ground and all that kind of stuff? And I love the wisdom of the word that brings such clarity to fuzzy situations. God clears up the questions by bringing it into real fine focus for us here tonight. You see it in verse 6. It says, Moses went to the Lord. And the Lord gave this word. He says, let them marry who they want, but not from someone over the border. Now, lest anyone misunderstand, this has nothing to do with racial issues. Absolutely nothing to do with it. This is what he was saying with it. Remember, these were the Israelites here. It doesn't have anything to do with these things. It has this focus. He's saying, which one do you want? What do you really want in life? Do you want the land you wanted on this side or do you want the man you wanted on that side? What is it you want? You can't live on both sides of the fence is basically what he's saying. If you want to live on this side, live on this side. Okay, fine, that's your choice. Marry someone from that side. 
but don't think you can live on this side and one on that side and all the rest of that. You can't be on both sides of the fence without consequence. That's the bottom line. And so many people say, man, I want it all. And I want it now. God, that's what I want. I want to marry whoever I want. I'm in love with a dude from Dan, and he's way over there, you know, on the other side. But that's okay, but I still want my land. I want to bring a boy home from Benjamin, you know, over in that tribe. And he's really cute and all the rest. But I want to be over here still. And he says, hey, fine. Do what you want to do. That's your choice. But the consequence is still there. I want the best of both worlds. Well, you can't have that. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. So God brings it into such focus here and says, which one do you want? If you want to do what you want to do, you do that. But there's what it means. And so I ask a question that I ask of myself, but I think it's a good one for all of us to ask. Are there any fuzzy fences in your life that you look at and say, no, it's just not real clear what to do here? I think a good question is, what's my focus? What's my focus? See, God made lizards in such a way that they can have eyes that kind of go in two different directions, and they can see two things at once in perfect clarity. But I know this much in my life. I can't do that. The way he made us as human beings, we may have two eyes, but we can only focus really on one thing. And physically, if you try to focus on two things at once, you know, both sides of the room here, everything's fuzzy. But when we focus on God's word, the fog just goes away. Things become very, very clear. And so I ask myself and I look and I, and I want to know, why do so few people really live the life of faith that God has promised, the, the fruitful life that God has given and I think so often in my own life, when I've fallen short of those things, it's because I ignored God's fences. I really looked at it and said, well, I want the promised life, but I want to live without these fences. I, I'd like no fences, but I would like the fruit. I want the promised life, but I want to live without any fellowship, you know, not real meaningful connection with other believers and with the Lord. I want the promised life here, you know, but... I don't want to run to God for forgiveness. I don't really think I need it. That's the other person who wronged me, you know, that kind of stuff. And I don't want that guy to get to run to the city of refuge. He doesn't deserve it. I do, but he doesn't, you know, that sort of thing. I want the promised life, but I don't want to focus fully on God. I want to have my cake and eat it too. But you know what? That doesn't work. It won't work. It'll never work. See, we talked about God's fences. And those are good things. But again, we have to talk at least a little about offenses, about the bad things that go on in our life, the selfishness and the self-will and that wall of denial and disobedience where we say, I, want, I don't want your fence, God. I want my fence and I want my horizon and I want my way and this is what I want it to be about. And you know what? That's a wall that's not a good wall. It's a wall that separates. It separates us from God and it separates us from one another. Sin always separates and you see those cities of refuges, refuge, many people would say, well, I don't need that. I don't need God's thing for me. That's for murderers, wasn't it? I never killed anybody, accidentally or on purpose. But remember, Jesus raised the bar a little bit in the New Testament when he said, hey, to hate in your heart. God knows the heart, and he judges the heart, and he sees the heart. He sees what others don't see, and he says, you know what? To hate in your heart is the same as to murder because the motivation's the same. And I think of it this way, you know, coming back into Miami, we read an article and it said that Miami was ranked number one for road rage. Did you see that? We got it again, yes! <laughs> National champions twice in a row, all right. You know, we may not have won everything, but we got that trophy, baby. <laughs> road rage, MVP. Maybe you're the MVP of road rage, you know. Why is everyone so mad in Miami? There were other places on the list, lots of places, many of them just great spots, you know, no reason to be so mad. Why is everyone so mad in Miami? Well, again, like it's so often the case in so many places, too few fences, too few fences. Not the physical kind, I'm talking about, again, too few folks in right relationship with God, and because of that, not in right relationship with one another. And you and I will never have, never ever, have quality friendships and quality family relationships until we get the first relationship right. See, that's why God put it in that order. Love the Lord with all your heart. That's how you're going to love the unlovable people. See, because the bottom line is God's really lovable. He's really lovable. People aren't always so <laughs> lovable. And so he says, if you're ever going to get this one right, if you're ever going to get the human horizontal right in your life, you have to get that vertical axis 
right. And you see, as I do that in the air, it draws across, and that's not an accident. See, that's where that horizontal and vertical meet, there at the cross. Now, we're almost done, but don't put your Bible away quite yet because you want to return to the section that we talked about, the city of refuge. City of refuge. Numbers 35, verse 25 to 28. And if you have a pen, get it ready. If you have a highlighter, get ready to use it. This is so interesting. I think it's worth looking at again, even after tonight. Three times you're going to see a key phrase in this section the death of the high priest. When it comes to the cities of refuge, something weird happened when the high priest died. If the high priest died, you know, the city of refuge is going along, announcement comes out, obituary, high priest died. Whoa! Everything changes. Look at this. Numbers 35, verse 25 to 28. So the congregation shall deliver the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of blood, and the congregation shall return him to the city of refuge where he had fled, and he shall remain there until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. And it says at that uh, point down in verse 28, if you jump down there again, you're going to see it two more times just so we don't miss it. It says he should have remained in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return to the land of his possession. Did you get what it's saying right there? If you're outside the city of refuge at any point before the death of the high priest, you know what would happen? You're a sitting duck for the avenger. You know, it's like you go, ha, 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 you can't get me. Boom. You know, wow, I was outside the wall. I was outside the fence. But one thing in that point would change everything. The death of the high priest. The death of the high priest sets everyone who had run to the city of refuge free. Now, what does this mean? Well, the New Testament makes it so clear. I love it. It clears the fog so well. Hebrews 4.14. Hebrews 4.14. Who's the high priest? Well, in the Old Testament, of course, it was Aaron and his descendants, but that was just a picture painted of a New Testament truth that God didn't want us to miss, so he repeats it over and over again. But Hebrews 4.14, Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has gone through the heavens... How did he get there? Well, he had to die first. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. I love that. Without sin, but not without sympathy. He understands. And he says, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You got a time of need? I know you do. Because the things we've talked about are hard. Putting fences in our lives, sometimes with family and friends, where they're supposed to be and where they haven't been, that's going to be tough sometimes. You know, when you think about forgiveness, when you think of even the fellowship and some of those things that it might mean to us, hey, those are going to be things I need to come to the throne of grace. I need more even than the city of refuge. And that's why God said, I got something better than the city of refuge. I got the throne of grace. And you see Jesus, the high priest, he has died. He has died. And when the high priest dies, all the charges were dropped and the people in the city of refuge get something even better than a temporary refuge. They get total restoration. They get to go back. Everyone gets to go free. Return to your homes and families and friends and the possession of the land that you had. Now, that would be a very strange law, I would think. Even some that you go, well, I, don't know, I don't know if that's fair. No, it's better than fair. It's better than fair. It's grace. And unless you realize that this is an Old Testament picture of a New Testament truth, you might say, well, that's weird. The, old, the high priest dies and everyone goes free. No, this is the point. The death of Jesus, the high priest, forever sets free all who run to him for refuge. He gives you more than refuge. It gives you restoration. So why would you run from Jesus when the obvious answer is to run to him? You don't have to live like a refugee. And so you see so many people, darling, you don't have to live like a refugee. But wandering in the wilderness, so many people do that. Running from the avenger, looking over their shoulder, or you know, trying to be the avenger and someone else. Man, that's not what we need. We don't need revenge. We need a relationship with God might say, well, how do I get that? Well, again, you go to the throne of grace. That's what you see. The high priest has died and gone to the heavens. It's done. What do you need to do? Come to the throne of grace. His death means your life. 
His sinlessness means your sin is gone. Well, I don't know if I want to do that. Won't Jesus fence me in? That's what I hear. Well, we talked about it tonight. You know, God's fences free us. They're for our benefit. They're for our blessing. Any fences that you'll see will be the best thing that has ever happened to your life. And so many people start singing, born to be wild. A wild thing. You know, that's me out in the wilderness. But you know, it's pretty dry out in the wilderness. It's a pretty empty place. It's not all it's cracked up to be. And so much more is available to us. God brings us out with those fences and those frontiers and says, hey, I have a promise life for you. And the grass is so much greener on his side of the fence. And so I'm going to close with a prayer. Let's pray tonight. Father, we thank you for your fences. We thank you for your mercy and for your grace and for the throne of grace. And right now, Lord, I pray if there's anybody in this room who has been running from you or running from an avenger or running from condemnation or from their past or fears of their future or anything else, Lord, that they would stop running from you And run to you. Run to you for refuge. And even more, restoration. God, I pray that for those who are believers here in this room, that God, we would live the life that you have promised because we are living it by faith and living it in obedience to your commands, to your fences. And God, right now, if there's anybody here in this room, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move upon their heart if they've never given their life to you, if they've never opened up their heart and their mind and their life to your mastery. Lord, I pray that they would do it now. With our eyes still closed, our heads still bowed, I'm just going to ask, as we do here every time we meet, because it's such an important part of why we meet, because we meet for fellowship, but we also meet for those who don't know that yet, those who haven't had that relationship with God. And God makes it so simple. He says, just simply run to me, come to me in faith. And you can do that here tonight simply by raising your hand to acknowledge your need. I'll pray with you. Just all you're doing by raising your hand is saying, I want a relationship with God. I don't want a relationship with a church so much or a group of people or a pastor or a priest or some religious thing that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about jesus the high priest the one who is in the heavens the one who created the heavens the one who wants to renew your heart if that's you here tonight i'm just going to ask you to acknowledge your need and i'll lead you in a prayer just say lord i need you here tonight raise your hand i see you there in the back anyone else here tonight things are kind of fuzzy for me my eyes aren't that great raise it high if you need it I see you over here. Anybody else here tonight want to acknowledge that? I see you here. God bless you. For those of you who raised your hand, I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. These are the words of a heart that want to come to God for forgiveness and freedom. Father God, I open my heart and I invite Jesus inside to be my friend, to be my forgiver, to be my Lord and Savior. And God, I ask you to wash me clean and to give me the life that you have promised, the abundant life now here on earth and the eternal life that you give after we die. And God, I want to follow you all the days of my life. And I know even when I fall, you'll be there to pick me up. And I thank you for that. I give you my life. I give you my future in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.